Verse 13. Each man's work will be, become evident. For the day will show it because it is to be revealed with fire. Notice, future tense. Will be revealed in the future with fire. And the fire itself will test the quality of each man's work. If any man's work, which is he has built on it remains, he will receive a reward. If any man's work is burnt up, he will suffer loss. But he himself will be saved, yet as through fire. So how we live life now, going to make a bigger difference, right? You really, really serve the Lord and do things for him, that's gold and silver. But you might be all religious. You might do all kinds of things, but you're doing it for self. That's straw. Going to get burned up. So what he has said about the future should determine a lot of how we live, if not everything, how we live life, right? So let my life be the proof, the proof of your love. Let my love look like you and what you made of. I've said before that um, in America we have certain diseases, and uh, one of the diseases is immediate gratification, immediate results, immediate fulfillment. Um, and we are blinded by it because here in America, we can get so many things right away. Uh, we can get what we want now, freedom now, relief now, pleasure now, money now, fulfillment now. Uh, even if it's not right. Even if it's not exactly ethical or moral, uh, it's not God's way, but I can get it now. Uh, and there's so much deception that has to be used, ungodliness, whatever it takes, but I can get it now. Uh, and if I don't get it now, then all kinds of stuff, poison comes out of my mouth, right? Foul language or whatever it is, but I want it now. Uh, and this disease is like an addiction that if I don't get it now, then I go nuts. I go crazy. Uh, anger. Uh, and if anger continues and continues because I'm not getting what I want, then depression. I have no motivation uh, because I'm addicted to the immediate. And here in America, especially, we uh, want to be very aware of that and know it, that it's not really the way to life. The things that are very, very important, that really go down to the soul and really nourish the soul, can take a long, long time so that for, the, for there to be a steadiness of that nourishment. But again, here in America, we're addicted to the immediate. And this is, isn't a, a new thing. The Apostle Paul, talking to, writing to Timothy, 1 Timothy chapter 6, instructing him because there's always, always people that want the quick, the immediate, the money now. Fulfillment now, even if they use religion, by the way. Even if they use church uh, to get what they want now. First Timothy chapter 6, verse 7. For we have uh, brought nothing into the world, so we cannot take anything out of it either. But those who want to get rich fall into temptation and a snare and many foolish and harmful desires which plunge men into ruin and darkness. That's the word of God. That's not mine. It's right there. For the love of money, not money, the love of money is the root of all sorts of evil. And some by longing for it have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. But flee 
From these things, you man of God, and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, perseverance, and gentleness. Fight the good fight of faith. In other words, it's not easy. Fight the good fight of faith. Take hold of eternal life to which you were called. And you made a good confession in the presence of many witnesses. I charge you in the presence of God who gives life to all things. In the, of Christ Jesus who testified the good confession before Pontius Pilate. That you keep the commandment without stain or reproach until the appearance, appearing of the Lord Jesus Christ. Which he will bring about at the proper time. He who is blessed and only potentate. The only all powerful one. The only sovereign one. The king of kings and lord of lords. Who alone possesses immortality. And dwells in unapproachable light. Whom no man has seen or can see. To him be honor and eternal dominion forever. Amen. But we in America have a different God. And we live in this culture and we give into it without wanting to or without intentionally just, okay, I'm gonna do the American way and go. No, we, no, I, I want God. But we get influenced and sucked in so automatically, you see. Uh, and without knowing it, we're following certain teachings, certain perspectives. And we're being taught all the time. The more you spend time in front of the screen, the more you're being taught. And there's faulty, ungodly teachings. It's the truth. And like I said, without knowing it, we flow right into it. Now, God has clearly communicated what's going to happen in the future. It's all over the place. Does that move you? What God has said about the future? Do God's revelations and predictions about the future play any part in our present planning and behavior? I have to ask that question of myself, of all of us, right? What God has said about the future, does it move me? Does it, like, wow, I need to change my, my, my ethics, my my behavior, my, 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 the way I spend money, the way I dress, the way I speak. Because God has said this and this and this about the future. I would dare say most of us do not act any differently. And again, if we do not, then who are we following? What teachings have penetrated in there and determined our behavior? Because that's a very, very serious question. And so we go back to what God has said. So that we can like, oh, yeah, okay. Ah, Lord, forgive me. Help me change. Right? That's why we go back to the word of God. And what we find, we're going to be in Amos chapter 8. My Bible is so used, I just flip it. There it is. <laughs> I thought I was going to flip back and forth. There it is. Amos chapter 8, verses 8 through 14. Faulty spiritual teachings. Notice the word there, uh, spiritual. It's not just about economics. No. Faulty spiritual teachings and practices lead to a bitter and hopeless end. A bitter and hopeless end. What is it? Faulty spiritual teachings and practices. Let me read the passage. Remember, most of you know already. 
Amos has been exposing the sins of God's own people. Well, more accurately, God has been exposing through Amos. And he exposed and he exposed and he exposed and they refused to repent. Made all kinds of rationalizations, all kinds of excuses. They wanted to even shut Amos up. Get out. Go down back to Judah. We don't want to hear it. You're offending us. Hmm. God said, okay, I've had enough. I've warned enough. And so now he says, the end is here. Amos chapter 8, starting in verse 8. Because of this will not the land quake, and everyone who dwells in it mourn? Indeed, all of it will rise up like the Nile, and it will be tossed about and subside like the Nile of Egypt. It will come about in that day, declares the Lord, that I shall make the sun go down at noon and make the earth dark in broad daylight. Then I shall turn your festivals into mourning and all your songs into lamentation. I will bring sackcloth on everyone's loins and baldness on their head. And I will make it like a time of mourning for an only son. And the end of it will be like a bitter day. Behold, days are coming, declares the Lord God, when I will send a famine on the land, not a famine for bread, or thirst for water, but rather for the hearing of the words of the Lord. People will stagger from sea to sea and from the north even to the east. They will go to and fro, seek the word of the Lord, but they will not find it. In that day, the beautiful virgins and the young men will faint from thirst as for those who swear by the guilt of Samaria, who say, as your God lives, O Dan, then as the way of Beersheba lives, they will fall and will not rise again. People refuse, refuse, refuse to repent. They would not hear the word of God. And so God says, um, there's going to be a bitter strip show. Normally we think of strip show as an ungodly and awful thing, right? Well, God says there's going to be a strip show. And it's going to be a bitter, bitter strip show. And it's going to end in a desperate, hopeless end. <laughs> wow. Wow. And for us, we need to pay attention because God was predicting to them what was going to happen. God has predicted to us, has revealed to us what's going to happen in the future. Amen. And so we ourselves need to say, well, what has God said about the future? Because in the past, he said some things and they came to pass. So we, okay, what happened here? What did God say? And so now let's look at what he actually said. Verse 8. Uh, the Nile in Egypt apparently has an annual flood. And when it floods, it overwhelms, you know, all the surrounding areas and people already know. And so they begin to prepare and so forth, right? But God uses that as an illustration, as an example, so people will, rem oh yeah, 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 the Nile, man, it overflows annually. And then he says, begin, because of this will not the land quake. And everyone who dwells in it mourn, quake. Imagine, all of a sudden, we're here, and this church, part of this church, this building goes up, and this goes down, and then this goes up, and that goes down. I mean, how secure would you feel? <laughs> Nothing is secure. 
God is saying the whole land is going to be going this number. The whole land. You know, land is usually a place of security, right? You know, when there's uh, anything that's wrong, okay, am I on ground? Am I on solid ground? The whole land is going to quake. And everyone who dwells in it will mourn. Mourn, uh, and by the way, it's repeated several times in verse 10. And in verse 11, there's mourning. Uh, it's a complete bankruptcy, a complete powerlessness. And in this context, you add the sense of complete humiliation. Complete, there's no resources to go and grab a hold of. Nothing. And so the whole land is going to be quaking and everyone is going to be mourning. Utterly, all their resources gone. Humiliation, powerlessness, naked. Indeed, all, who, um, all of it will rise uh, like the Nile and it will be tossed about and subside like the Nile of Egypt. And what he's talking about that is not so much the land. He's talking about the mourning, the, the, the sense of loss and the sense of humiliation. That's what he's talking about. Not just the land. The mourning is going to be so overwhelming, like the Nile floods. And you can't do anything about it. The anguish, the suffering inside is going to be like that, like the flooding of the Nile. And so now he goes into details to why. It will come out, uh, it will come about in that day, declares the Lord. This is the Lord declaring, the sovereign Lord. That the sun will go down at noon and make the earth dark in broad daylight. So the first thing is, you know, what happens if at mid, at, right now at noon, all of a sudden it gets super, super dark where you can't even see the hand in front of your face. Any business going to go on? No lights, no traffic, no nothing. Complete darkness in the middle of the day. I mean, people, oh my goodness, right? And that's what he's saying. Complete, nobody's going to know what to do. The sun in the middle of the day, right? Then I, and I want you to notice, five times... From verse 9, 10, 11, and 11. Five times is the first person singular. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this. It's not the president of the United States. It's not the queen of whatever. This is God saying, I'm going to do this. <laughs> the almighty God Five times. Can anybody stop God? No. He controls the whole universe. I'm the one that's going to call this darkness. Then I will turn your festivals into mourning. There's the same word again. Complete, abject, loss of everything. Anguish and humiliation, a sheer nakedness, and you can't do anything about it. And all your songs into lamentations. I will bring this mourning that, you know, people would lie on the ground and throw ashes on themselves and shave their heads and just bald and like me. No hope of it ever growing back. But total complete. And I will make it like a mourning for an only son. To lose a loved one and have absolutely, absolutely no power to do anything about it. Gone. And then, if it's the only son, only child, I 
God is saying, I'm going to make that day like that. You refuse to listen. And I sent you Amos over and over and over and you refused. And the end of it will be like a bitter day. Like a bitter day. Uh, and then he goes on to show more as to why this is going to be uh, so devastating. And here's the worst part of it all in verse 11. We normally don't think like this. He says in verse 11, behold... The days are coming, declares the Lord, that I will send a famine on the land. Not a famine for bread or, for, uh, or a thirst for water, but rather for hearing the words of the Lord. No more understanding, no more hearing of the word of God, not just not hearing it, but not understanding it. Can't connect with what God is saying. And I'm afraid that these days many uh, preachers won't preach the word. Because the congregation can't stand it. They won't understand. It's too hard. And I, I, I can relate to that. You know, kind of, I, I need to soften it up. Uh, throw a little morphine in there or something. It's hard. Uh, I remember a PhD professor, and I'm not lying. A PhD professor tell me, Ruben, you make me think too much. And the songs we sing, I just want to express. <laughs> Don't make me think. A PhD. And by the way, this was years ago. Can you imagine today? There's no more understanding and being able to handle what God has said. And you see, when we don't turn to what God has said, we're going to turn to someone. We're going to turn to some teachings. No matter who you are. That's the reality. And faulty teachings lead to really bad consequences. Take, for instance, a very obvious one. What are the teachings... In an alcoholic family, right? In an alcoholic family, the husband gets drunk, the wife gets drunk, or whatever. What's being taught there? How is life working there? Uh, here's how to get things done in an alcoholic family. Pretension, deception, using others for self. Double standards, manipulation, hurtful means of immediate relief of stress, yelling and screaming, and the list goes on and on and on and on. That's the practices and teachings in an alcoholic family. What are the effects? The, and the effects, especially on the children, frustration, confusion, perpetuation of the harmful means of immediate Relief of stress, profound wounds, broken relationships, depression, lostness, and the list goes on and on and on for 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years because of the bad teachings and practices in an alcoholic family. Uh, and because of these practices, again, it just leads to disaster, right? Turn to Proverbs, Proverbs chapter 1, 
uh, Proverbs chapter 1, um, starting in verse 10. Proverbs chapter 1, starting in verse 10. My son, if sinners entice you, do not consent. If they say, come with us, let us lie in, in wait for blood. Let us ambush the innocent without cause. Let us swallow them up like Sheol, even whole as those who go down to the pit. We shall find all kinds of precious wealth. We shall fill our houses with spoil. Throw in your lot with us. We shall all have one purse. Huh. My son, do not walk in the way with them. Keep your feet from their path. For their feet run to evil and they hasten to shed blood. Indeed, it is useless to spread the bait net in the front of any bird. But they lie in wait for their own blood. They ambush their own lives. So are the ways of everyone who gains by violence. It takes away the life of the possessor. But initially it's, it sounds so like we're going to make money. We're going to do good. We're going to. Now that's very obvious. Right? Somebody tells us, let's go rob a, rob a bag. And most of us say, no. But it doesn't have to be that obvious. Faulty bad teachings. Oh, my. How about workaholism? How about worldliness? How about materialism? How about hedonism? Hedonism, pleasure is the highest good. Woo! We're being given those in massive doses into our veins every day. Every day. And we don't even know it. We don't even feel it. And the list goes on and on and on and on. You see. Uh, on the other hand, good family teachings produce good consequences. Right? Right there in Proverbs 3. Proverbs 3. Uh, <clears throat> starting in verse 1. Proverbs 3, starting in verse 1. My son, and once again, here is a godly parent talking to a son, trying to inculcate, trying to teach good teachings to him. Right? Proverbs 3, verse 1. My son, do not forget my teaching, but let your heart keep my commandments for length of days and years of life and peace they will add to you. Do not let kindness and truth leave you. Bind them around your neck. Write them on the tablet of your heart. So you will find favor and good repute in the sight of God and man. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. And do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him. And he will make your path straight. Do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord. And turn away from evil. It will bring healing to your body. And refreshment to your bones. Isn't that great? Teaching from the word of God. For length of days and health and peace and good relationships. Isaiah 40, Isaiah 40, uh, one of those passages that I just love. Isaiah 40, starting in verse 6. <clears throat> A voice says, call out then. Then he answered, what shall I call out? All flesh is grass and all its loveliness is like the flower of the field and the grass stands for human beings and its loveliness all its mental powers 
All is emotional powers. All is physical powers. All is mental abilities. Powerful to create and to go to the moon and back. And who knows where else? The beauty, the loveliness of the flesh. Hmm. Verse 7. The grass withers. The flower fades. When the breath of the Lord blows upon it. Surely the people are grass. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of the Lord stands forever. What teachings are you following? Uh, I'm going to present a little... um, Diagram to kind of illustrate some of the teachings that are today. Uh, there it is. Are we showing up there? Nope. Oh, there it is. We are body, soul, and spirit. All human beings, body, soul, and spirit, right? That's what the Word of God says. But here's the problem the outer is the physical. The middle part, let's say the soulish, and the middle part, the spiritual. This is just a diagram, guys. This is not inspiration or whatever. This is just trying to understand who we are as human beings, right? But now what we get as a teaching is that, look, you fulfill the physical, and you know what else? When you fulfill the physical... It feels like your whole being is fulfilled. Just get the physical, which includes the money, the things, whatever. Just get that fulfilled and you don't have to worry about anything else. And the trick is that at times it does feel that if I take care of my physical being, whether it's food or sex, and I'm there in the hot tub with a drink. Oh, my goodness, I've gone to heaven. Everything is fulfilled. Faulty, bad teachings. But that's where we get from the world. Oh, let's get a little bit more complicated. Okay, well... When the physical is there and there and there and there, it's, something's missing. Oh, you know what? I need relationships. Oh, good. Very good. And so, let's get good relationships. Well, how do you get them? Well, money, skin, uh, intelligence. Uh, I'm going to be an expert on something and people are going to respect me and what have you. Here we go. And when I get to fulfill the soulish, the physical and the soulish, man, that's it. I've reached heaven. And there's faulty teachings as well. You see, faulty teachings as well. Because sooner or later we find out. It's like someone said, you know, I love you. You love me. Let's get married. They get married. And then things begin to stink. You know, these human beings, man. Yeah. Okay, then. Let's go back to the, to the physical. Just buy more stuff. Travel more. Do more physical things. And faulty teachings. Faulty, faulty teachings. The spiritual is what's most fundamental and of most critical Just look at those two passages there. Proverbs 4. Proverbs 4. Verse 23. Proverbs 4, verse 23. Watch your heart. And obviously obviously he's talking about the non-physical heart. The non-physical part of your being. Watch your heart with all diligence. 
for from it flow the springs of life. It's the spiritual that's most fundamental, most critical. Right? Philippians chapter 4. Philippians chapter 4, verse 6 and 7. Philippians chapter 4, verse 6 and 7. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication. Notice prayer and supplication. Non-physical. With thanksgiving in your, uh, let your request be known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, will guard your what? Will guard your heart and your minds in Christ Jesus. You see that? The word of God brings us what we really, really need deep down in our spirit. But we don't, when we don't have that, we go back. And we think this is the way, right? But when we begin to deal with the spirit and turn to the Lord and see what he has to give us, there's going to be the right priorities. There's going to be a good balance. Things are going to be set where they're at. So we're going to be able to enjoy the physical. We're going to be able to enjoy the relational with other human beings. And we're going to have good nourishment in our souls. No matter the other, the soulish and the physical. You see? But we don't get that. We don't get that. Um, these faulty teachings today. And people are following it all the time. And it's going to get really, really bad. And God says this famine, where nobody's really listening to the word of God anymore and dealing with the soul, with the spirit that is. Verse 12. People will stagger from sea to sea and from the north even to the east. You got to remember Israel was that where location. If you go south of Israel, it's desert. If you go east of Israel, it's the Mediterranean Sea. So it's like, got to go north or east. You're going to find something. No, people are going to stagger, meaning they're going to be flopping around like fish out of water. Panicking, desperate. Because all the money in the world, all the physical things in the world can never, never, ever fulfill on an ongoing basis. Temporarily they can. But you see, we're so stuck and addicted to faulty teachings that that's where we wind up. And then we, you know, it can be... Three years later, ten years later, five decades later, but then sooner or later we become desperate because we know it doesn't work. And they're going to stagger them, stumble. They're going to be look desperate. They will go to and fro and seek the word of the Lord, but they will not find it. I don't know if you noticed in the scripture reading from Proverbs chapter 1, I don't know if you noticed, but just Proverbs chapter 1. Verse 24. Proverbs 1 verse 24. Because I called and you refused, I stretched out my hand and no one paid attention. This is wisdom being personified as someone who's speaking. Wisdom is calling out, calling out. Verse 25, and you neglected all my counsel and did not want me, you did not want my reproof. I will also laugh at your calamity. I will mock when you, your dread comes. When your dread comes like a storm and your calamity comes like a whirlwind. 
When distress and anguish come upon you, then they will cry, uh, call on me, but I will not answer. Mm. And this is what the Lord is communicating now to his own people. Because they refused and they refused and they refused. They're going to go all over the place. I want the word of God. I want who? What? There's no churches preaching the word. I can't. No. Nah. They're not going to find it. This is God speaking. In that day, verse 13, the beautiful virgins and the young men, beauty and physical prowess, useless, useless. Hmm. Isn't that amazing? Doesn't matter how beautiful. Doesn't matter how strong. Wow. It will faint. The Hebrew there is they will wither. They will melt. Won't get up again. And what's the fundamental problem? What is the fundamental problem? Verse 14. What does verse 14 say? Here were faulty spiritual teachings. Faulty spiritual teachings. Non biblical teachings. What does it say, verse 14? As for those who swear by the guilt of Samaria, Samaria, and say, as our God lives in Dan. If you remember the foundation of the nor northern kingdom, Jeroboam said, oh, if they go to Jerusalem to worship there, they're going to turn back to Rehoboam. No, no, no. I got a solution. Let's make two golden calves and put one in Samaria, one in Dan. And people, oh, that's a good idea. Convenient. You see, we don't have to travel all the way up to Jerusalem. Man, what a genius. And they would go to Samaria and Dan. And by the way, we take pilgrimage there. It says there, and as the way of Beersheba lives, in other words, look at our religion. And it's connected to God. No. No. Faulty, non-biblical, spiritual teachings leads to disaster. Absolute disaster. And who is doing this? God is doing this. And what, when he does this, it's absolutely fatal. No solution. Absolutely hopeless. How do I get that? Look at the end of the verse. The end of verse 14. They will fall and not rise again. That's the fundamental problem. Religious, theological, false teachings. And where are you today? Where am I? We need to be serious and go back to the word of God. And it's again, because what? The world is continuing to offering, offering all kinds of stuff, no? Oh my goodness, they're coming up with unbelievable Technological marvels, man. And, and if we don't have a good foundation on what God has said, then you know, it sounds really good. And boom, there we go. 
and what happens after some time that people follow that? You know, sooner or later they begin to get super tired and empty and lonely. I mean, it's just mind-boggling. I mean, the studies are out. The more screens in the house, the deeper the depression and loneliness in the house. The studies are out. But you see, we're addicted to the immediate. It feels good, man. <laughs> man. And we're not taking care of our souls. And we get tired. We have no margin to give to anybody. Because we're running around to and fro from sea to sea. And from one thing to another. And no time to nourish our souls in the word of God. No time to nourish with good, solid music that lifts the soul up. Not just gives me the goosebumps. It really nourishes my soul. There's no relationship with God other than a rational understanding of who God is. And that's why, you know, God knows that. Jesus knew that when he was here. And when we begin to see the downward, emotional, depressive effects of faulty spiritual teachings. Now we begin to understand why Jesus said, come unto me, all you who are weary and heavy laden. I have rest for your souls. My yoke is easy. Compared to when you're trying to do it on your own. Matthew 11 in the New Testament. Matthew 11. He had tried and tried and tried in the. Rejection kept intensifying, intensifying, intensifying. And he finally denounced everyone. Verse 28, Matthew eleven twenty-eight: Come unto me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. Learn from me. For I am gentle and humble in heart and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. But we, we think we have to do it ourselves. And we go fight and fight and fight and fight. Why? Because we're not nourishing our souls. We just think of the physical and human beings. But never vertical. You see. Young and old. We need to turn to the Lord for nourishment. That's the first application. That's the first application. And then the second application is, listen, listen very carefully. We need to have very accurate understanding of the gospel. Very accurate understanding of the gospel. Because that is the way to eternal life and the life here on earth as well. Because there's all kinds of gospels out there. We can go from the extreme to Buddhism, Islam, and yes, Islam, and all kinds of other isms. All the way to the deception of saying, um, yes, we need to trust in Jesus, but also... You need to do this and this and this as well. All kinds of deceptive things. And if we're not clear on the gospel, not good. In fact, Galatians 1, Galatians 1, this is how serious it is. Galatians 1, the apostle Paul, talking to the Galatians. Look at this. This is very important. This is one of those like, we better get this straight. 
Galatians 1 verse 8. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to what we have preached to you, let him be accursed. Accursed means condemned. Go to hell. Oh, and then he repeats it. Verse 9. As we have said before, so I say again now, if any man is preaching to you a gospel contrary to what we, you have received, he is to be accursed. Wow. Mm. The gospel that the Lord Jesus Christ died for our sins, was buried, and on the third day he rose again from the dead. Jesus died for our sins, rose again from the dead. The gospel. When we trust, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ as our Savior. Savior from what? Savior from the eternal wrath of God. And the eternal wrath of God is there because of sin. Not because of mistakes. Not because I misspoke. No, no, no. Sin. And it brings about the wrath of God. Jesus saves us from the wrath of God because he paid for our sins. And believing, trusting in that work, not your own work, not whether you go to church, not whether you get baptized, not whether you give money or not. No, no, no. Trust. Rely upon the finished work at the cross. Will you, if you've never have, Trust in the Lord Jesus Christ in that way. And that same gospel, listen. That same gospel that Jesus died for my sins and rose again from the dead is to inform me and motivate me and help me behave every day. Not just for when I die. Why? Because the gospel tells me that the God of all the universe, the judge who will send and judge people going to hell or heaven for eternity, that same judge accepts me in Jesus Christ. And if the sovereign king of kings accepts me, who are you? <laughs> See, we begin to be free. To live out the gospel because I am secure. The Lord accepts me in Jesus Christ. You see? Fundamental gospel. We better get it right. Because that can determine into eternity. Right? Into eternity. So that's the second application. Get the gospel right. Jesus died for our sins and rose again from the dead. That's the way to eternal salvation and everyday living now, here now. Third application and final one. You know, <clears throat> as I had mentioned in Amos, God was talking about the future to them, right? And God has spoken to the future to us, right? And I, I had already said one, right? Uh, John uh, 3, John 3, not 316, take it easy. John 3, verse 36. John 3, 36. He who believes in the Son of has eternal life, but he who does not obey the Son will not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. The wrath of God abides in him. So the future again, the gospel, right? Uh, but then, it's not just salvation. What's going to happen afterwards as well? When we get to heaven, let's say you trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ. Does our behavior today affect that? Well, 1 Corinthians 3, glad you asked. 
1 Corinthians 3. Don't worry, I'll end with this. 1 Corinthians 3, starting in verse 12. Now, if any man builds on the foundation with gold, well, no, um, let's start with verse 11. For no man can lay a foundation other than the one which is laid, which is Christ Jesus, right? The gospel, we believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, that's the foundation of all of life into eternity. Into it, all this life and into eternity, right? That's the foundation, Jesus Christ. But now, if we've trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ, now what? Verse 12. Now, if any man builds on the foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw. There's a different value there, right? From buying hay to having gold. Verse 13. Each man's work will be, become evident. For the day will show it because it is to be revealed with fire. Notice, future tense will be revealed in the future with fire. And the fire itself will test the quality of each man's work. If any man's work, which is he has built on it remains, he will receive a reward. If any man's work is burnt up, he will suffer loss. But he himself will be saved, yet as through fire. So how we live life now is going to make a bigger difference. Right? You really, really serve the Lord and do things for him. That's gold and silver. But you might be all religious. You might do all kinds of things, but you're doing it for self. That's straw. Going to get burned up. So what he has said about the future should determine a lot of how we live, if not everything, how we live life, right? The people in Amos' time didn't listen, did not listen. Will you and I? It's our choice, right? We all have to make choices. And by the way, every day is like many choices that we can make to live for the Lord. Many, many choices, right? Where we spend our time, what we allow to enter our eyes, what we allow to come out of our mouth, what, oh my goodness, choice after choice after choice. Say, God, help us. Because as someone said, how we live today will echo into eternity. Your choice. My choice. Faulty teachings are all over the place. Faulty spiritual teachings and practices are all over the place, but they lead to bitterness and hopelessness. What will be your choice? Heavenly Father. Heavenly Father. Thank you for your word, Lord, that shows us and instructs us and nourishes our souls. God, help us understand more. Lord, if there's anyone here or listening that, who has never trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ as personal Savior, today, today is the day of salvation. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved from the wrath of God. And if you've already trusted, grow in him. Learn in Him. Cry out to God for help, for understanding. Ask questions. Oh, Father, be with all of us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So let my life be the